Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us today on AGL Live. We're going to talk to a few folks from 18F today about Agile and a new tool that 18F created to make acquisition easier. We're going to start with brief introductions. I'm Elizabeth Raley, Director of Professional Services at Civic Actions. I'm a practicing Scrum Master and also in the working group of AGL. And I'll pass over to Rafi for his intro. I'm Rafi Vilas. I'm part of 18F. I'm a product lead on the C2 team. Glad to be here. Great. John? Hi, I'm John Solomon. I um, joined uh, the government originally in the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, and now I am working at GSA in our federal acquisition service. Welcome. And Rob? Hi, I'm Rob Reed. Uh, I've been working with Agile Gov Leadership for a while. I was a Presidential Innovation Fellow with both John and Rafi and worked for 18F. And uh, now I am attempting to start a charity called Public Invention where I build robots, among other things. Um, so let's get started. Um, I've had the pleasure to work with both Rafi and John um, extensively. Um, one of the things that has been pointed out about the Presidential Innovation Fellowship is that when the fellowship ends, often people stay in government as the three of us did, although I have now left government. Um, Rafi is working for 18F, which some of our viewers are probably familiar with, uh, but John is working for a different part of the GSA, which I suspect um, people are not familiar with. So John, would you tell us a little bit about uh, that division of the GSA and how it relates to 18F and what you're doing? Sure. So. Um... Historically, GSA has been assigned two major roles. One is that they own and manage many of the buildings that government agencies are uh, located in. And the other is that they provide services related to acquisition. So the government spends about $300 billion every year um, in the non-weapons, non-military um, side of acquisition and GSA plays an important role in uh, providing the tools that, that help to do that better through uh, the Federal Acquisition Service. Thank you. Um, so uh, when we first started 18F, um, a number of us had joined 18F from our Presidential Innovation Fellowships. Uh, one of the first things we were asked to do uh, was to support the GSA itself with a project which at the time we called Communicart. Um, I think you guys may have renamed it. And I worked on that for about six months and then handed it over to Rafi um, when I started working on 18F Consulting. Um, so Rafi, can you please explain Communicart and uh, explain why it's important and what we're trying to do with it? Sure, so uh, Communicart is a project that we started with the Acquisition Gateway. Um, and the, um, well, it used to be called the Common Acquisition Platform. And I would say that the mission there for them is just uh, targeting uh, procurement uh, officials and making their lives easier. Uh, so that would be part of their mission. And um, they came to ATNF with a bunch of ideas um, after doing a little bit of uh, open-ended user research with procurement officials. Um, they were able to pinpoint a few problems. And one of those problems was with people making purchase card requests, um, in particular purchase card holders. And these are people who actually hold government credit cards making purchases for the government. A lot of them were having um, trouble getting their purchase card approvals uh, approved in time. Um, as you know, you, you can't just take a government credit card and go on Amazon.com and buy uh, gifts for your nephews and nieces. Um, you, you most likely have to get them approved by not only one, but maybe two or three people. Um, and at the time, people were making the request by um, literally typing in an email saying, I need to spend X amount of money uh, for this purchase uh, for this reason. Uh, can you approve this? And uh, putting in the two field and the CC fields, the multiple people that had approved them. And so you can imagine the issues that came with managing that whole process. And so um, we started the community cart, which is now called C2, um, with a, a prototype uh, to address that need. Um, so I'll get a little bit more into that, but that's kind of the gist of it. Um, and fast forward to now, we've launched with 
um, National Capital Region, which is um, for PBS, which is one of the arms of GSA. Uh, we have about 500 uh, current users and they um, currently are using the software to actually do their jobs. It was mandated by PBS to for this particular region to uh, get their approvals, uh, per approval card purchases uh, uh, done through this mechanism. Okay, and so let me just um, interrupt a little bit and take a, a step back. So um, can you remind us what the acronym PBS stands for? Uh, it's not public broadcasting system. <laughs> um, it's a, a, a public building services. Right. Um, and it is one of the arms of GSA, um, in addition to, um, John mentioned, FAS, uh, Federal Acquisition Services. Right. Uh, and, and so PBS is responsible more for the real estate side of um, um, their business. Sure. And, and you explain this, but I, I'm sure some of our viewers this may not be obvious. When we talk about government procurement, sometimes we're talking about buying a hundred million dollar software system or, um, you know, something really, really big. But sometimes we're talking about just buying pencils. Right. You you or you know, firefighting suits or shovels or uh, fire extinguishers, that, that sort of thing. And so one of the things that the GSA does is it helps other agencies purchase those low level things. And that is what is purchased with the so-called uh, purchase card, right? Exactly. Yep. And the approval process exists to um, prevent waste, fraud and abuse, right? I mean, the it it, it, the government is very fair and tries to prevent all corruption. And sometimes it puts in cumbersome paperwork to make sure that happens. So basically, a, a, a person in the government who has the right to purchase pencils for their office normally has to get someone to approve the fact that those pencils are needed. And if I remember correctly, one of the problems is the Department of Agriculture may do that differently than the Department of the Navy, than Fish and Wildlife. They may all have slightly different approval processes for uh, how to do that, right? Sure, yep. And there are a, other, a few other problems that came up. You can imagine how cumbersome it is to either do the process by paper, which a lot of government agencies are still doing, um, coming into the office and filling out a sheet of paper and having multiple people sign off on something. Um, and then you have um, at the next level up, I think it's the email um, chain right. where um, you type it in and multiple people have to keep track of this linear process. You can imagine being the third person in an approval process, getting an email that um, is not approved by the two people in front of you and having to keep um, that um, kind of tribal knowledge of who needs to go when um, in your head. And so um, this software really was the impetus for that of, um, you know, this this makes sense that this needs to live in a database. Um, you know, you can imagine the, the problems with um, doing reporting. Um, if an auditor came by and said, we want to know more about this transaction um, for this purchase of these pencils, um, they uh, the requester would literally go in their email, do a search in their Google Mail, print out the chain of approvals and um, hand over a stack of papers to this auditor uh, to show that these have been in fact approved in the correct uh, order. Right, so, so the goal of Communicart in the end is to provide more transparency and to save a lot of time for a very large number of federal employees who have to buy relatively low level um, purchase things, right? Yes. Okay, Absolutely. great, well, please go on. Great. So, um, <laughs> what was the question now? <laughs> well, maybe, John, this, you... maybe this is a good time to show us C2 itself. Oh, sure. Well, yeah, let's do that. And you can feel free to edit um, my uh, the, the transitions here or whatnot. Um, so, what I'm going to do is just do, do a quick walkthrough of how this uh, software kind of works. Can you see this all right? Yes. So this is the existing uh, UI, and, and what this is doing here is um, pretty much is what happens in live production where a requester is requesting some work to be done. In this case, 
uh, a vendor would need to come in and paint a room polka dot, which is probably not very common in government. Uh, but um, you can imagine painting a room um, needing to be approved. And um, a lot of this is really domain specific for the National Capital Region, uh, but essentially they're, they're indicating what building, what um, service center or kind of area they're um, uh, making the request for, and they're including who the vendor is. Um, I included Rob's contractors, and I'm just making the request. Uh, much better experience than typing all of this out in an email. Um, I might have to pause this at some point uh, just to kind of, uh, but you can see here how we've generated a unique ID. Um, so this is something that, um, believe it or not, people were actually creating their own unique IDs to reference in their emails when they're typing that out. Uh, you immediately get a status. Um, so you see here the step one, step two, of who needs to approve. And we essentially have given them a place to see all the activities for this particular request. And so as activity for this request go through, you'll see that on that page. Um, here you see the email that would go to the first approver. Um, and we've solved the problem of sending a request to multiple people by um, controlling the visibility of these emails to whoever it is that would need to approve that time. So this means that this budget approver has no idea this exists, the uh, GSA approver, these are obviously uh, test emails, uh, but this GSA approver would only see it at the time that they need to. So their step one, they see all of the information that they need to approve all there in the body of the email and they have a nice convenient approve button uh, to approve it. So um, you'll see a lot of this um, interaction is triggered uh, by an email kind of experience. And this is kind of from our user research, we found that people didn't necessarily want to go into an app or uh, a native uh, iPhone or uh, Android experience. They were perfectly comfortable getting uh, kind of prompted by emails. And so we kind of started out with that in mind, uh, prompting people through emails, but still giving them the appropriate information that they needed in the body of the email. So you see here, the first approver approved, the status updates immediately, and we then send the next email over. Um, you can see here, we allow you to add comments, and like any good web app, there are related emails that get triggered for that. You can see here the second person gets the email. Again, they see all the information there and by the email. And we're pretty much going through the happy path here of everything looks good, uh, but there are a lot of other things that um, the app can do. It can actually manage changes in the um, uh, attributes and things like that. Uh, but just kind of wanted to show that um, you can approve in different ways. You can approve through the email. You can approve here in the web app. And you can see here, this has changed the status from pending to completed. And I'll pause it here for a second. This is the email that the um, requester would get. You get that nice big green check mark. And they now can spend the money because they know it has been approved. And that kind of closes the loop on the approval process. Um, I'm kind of showing here of how you can modify requests. And so this was a big pain point for people who are making their requests through emails. Uh, there were also a bunch of agencies that were doing these requests um, with spreadsheets. And you can imagine having to manage these modifications in the spreadsheets, it's, it's virtually impossible to be able to track um, who it is that needs to approve things or um, kind of the history of it. But you can see here on the left-hand side, uh, the activity. So you can see that the description was changed from uh, a previous value to another value. In this case, maybe an approving official might have said, hey, I need a better description. Uh, you know, uh, put a, a more descriptive uh, uh, text in there and we track everything. So we try to make all of the changes visible um, and try to make it as easy as possible or an easy user experience for the users. Okay, great. Well, um, I, I don't think um, our users are interested in the, the 
minutia of this, um, but it, there are some things that I think are important to point out. Um, for example, it has a very modern look and feel, which is somewhat unusual for a government application. And I think you guys should be um, very proud of that. Um, also, uh, if correct me, um, it can work with different approval processes with many different agencies. Absolutely. Right? So, um, and John can speak a little bit to this. I think the big uh, picture goal of this is for it to be uh, a reusable app. Um, like I mentioned before, this is a problem that's happening across government. Uh, so many people are making purchases for government, getting them approved uh, by email or paper process. And uh, this is architected in a way um, to be flexible for different um, agencies, whether it's uh, multiple approvers, um, whether it's uh, maybe some of the logic that might happen um, on the front end of the form. Um, so we're, we're trying, you know, we're not uh, completely self-serve at this point. Uh, but the, the vision is that this would be scalable to uh, multiple use cases, not just uh, the ones that are used for GSA. Great. And um, I know both of you guys are big champions of the use of agile software methodologies within government. I, I would like, John, to speak to um, uh, the level of success that C2 is having and acceptance and how agile techniques may have assisted in that. Sure. Um... The, um, you know, a lot of times when I'm explaining um, Agile, um, th there's two metaphors. One I like to use is that um, we're not overdriving our headlights. So, you know, we're never committing more, um, more design, more money, more effort um, than we can see what we're going to get at the other end. So it, it, it sort of reduces the room for error. Um, for anyone who's a rock climber, that's sort of like, the idea that um, you can only fall, you know, twice the distance of your last uh, protection. So, um, you know, what Agile gives us is a chance to do exactly that, to, um, you know, to run a program like this where we're doing something that's that's quite new. Um, nobody had solved this particular problem in this way before. Um, and um, rather than have to prove to, um, you know, some sort of an oversight board, that you know, a, a million plus dollar program was going to be the success story. You know, we've been able to proceed um, incrementally, exactly the way that, that Agile um, is meant to work. Um, another big plus is that um, having live software early, as, aside from all of the the reasons that you know we, we're familiar with it in the developer community, really helps when you're trying to uh, explain what you're doing to stakeholders or to sponsors, because it's much easier for them to comprehend a demo of, of even an MVP or a, a pre-MVP version of a product than to look at a PowerPoint presentation of block diagrams and bullet points and understand what it is that you're trying to solve as a problem. Um, and of course, then there's just been like um, a lot of our, our success in terms of being able to uh, solve problems has been the ability to to pretty quickly um, understand needs and change. One of the things that uh, that we we learned on this program is that you know early on um, we were doing a lot of uh, user research uh, and it almost felt that every time we talked to a new user they had a a new and different set of needs and it was really hard to find that critical mass um, that was going to be the product that we needed. But by by continuing to have the flexibility to, to sort of change our view of, of what the, the, the MVP was, eventually we, we did encounter this um, very um, clear case of an agency that needs to, um, to track their workflows. Um, and, and in the case of PBS, they were acknowledging that they were struggling with it. So uh, being agile let us first of all to let us first of all find them and second of all be responsive to their needs thank you um yeah and pbs is the public building service uh part of the gsa so you know um speaking as an agile theorist you know kent beck always talked about the fact that agile allows you to fail quickly and fail in an inexpensive way and learn something that prevents you from having 
big catastrophic failures. And, you know, we have only to read the newspaper to learn about failures of government IT projects that cost a hundred million dollars or, uh, or more. Um, can you give some examples of, uh, learnings that you had due to an agile process that might have headed off much more expensive failures in C2 and Communicart? Um, Rafi might have specifics. If you don't mind, I would, I would offer a couple just from, uh, well, actually he's nodding his head. So let, let's hear about the ones on, on C2. Otherwise I was going to offer sure. some from a couple other projects. Yeah, um, one thing that comes to mind is just the um, initial tech stack. You know, um, today I was actually looking at some old architecture diagrams. Um, we're, we're currently um, kind of uh, working with a new vendor to hand off the project. Um, and part of that was to just review the architecture. And, and some of the old architecture kind of reminded me of how quickly we stood this up. You know, we had a, a Node um, Node.js app. We had a Python scraper. We had our main Rails app. Um, we were um, kind of bootstrapping stuff through Gmail, SMTP, um, and we eventually um, kind of shed ourselves from a couple of those things and ended up with a, you know, Rails app. And um, so, it's um, it's just kind of showing you that um, moving fast and getting stuff working um, early on um, is it, it doesn't have to. Um, necessarily mean commitment to those, uh, you know, those technologies. So in, in some sense, those technologies could be seen as failures because, you know, they didn't um, kind of stand the test of time in that, but um, those allowed us to prove out some concepts, you know. Uh, another thing that comes to mind is things like um, just uh, things that we're trying to prove on the user side. You know, um, one idea was um, this kind of bookmarklet idea of, um, a requester going to maybe Home Depot or Crate and Barrel or uh, a place where they're buying something and being easily easily being able to add that to their um, cart um, of items that need to get to approved. Um, but it just never really took. And, um, you know, it might have taken a, a day for someone to kind of concept that. Um, and so um, very fast failure. Um, but um, gave us an ability to get something in front of people to get validation and, you know, move on if it didn't stick. Right, right. And I, I think this is very important. Um, did you want to say something, John? Yeah, I was, I, I was going to add, um, especially because we're talking about Agile in government, which um, has its own set of challenges. Um, a couple of the examples that, that, that I would share, and I, and I don't really need to give too much background um, on the product itself, uh, the, the C2 product is part of a program we're calling the Acquisition Gateway, which um, you know, anyone could find if they, they went and looked for it. But um, what we've experienced on that program, and it's, I, I think it's typical of many government IT efforts, is that there's an awful lot of governance from um, above in place of user research from outside. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the nature of government is that you, you sometimes have to acknowledge those, um, those, those pressures, but by being agile, we would always have, we would often have the chance to say, well, let's go ahead and do a, like an initial pass of, of what you're asking for. And if people respond the way that you're anticipating, we can keep going. Um, in fact, um, on multiple uh, fronts, we were able to, for us, you know, I guess in that case, uh, really do the fail fast because we built what was asked for um, for the first steps. We were able to to show that it wasn't really the thing that the users were asking for or were going to benefit from. And that's probably uh, that's probably saved more money than um, than we've spent on some other parts of the program. Well, that, that, that's a brilliant observation. Um, I'm reminded that sometimes in the military uh, calls things like that a GOBI or a general officer with a bright idea. Um, and uh, by virtue of the political power, a, a general officer or a very high ranking government official can really derail a project by uh, attempting to drive it in the direction that they think is the correct way to drive it 
without getting very much validation or feedback for a very long time. And one of the nice things about Agile is that it gives that feedback quickly and essentially makes the whole system more transparent, uh, hopefully even to the general officer who had the idea uh, in the first place. Um, so thank you, uh, that, that's rather interesting. Um, I was gonna ask about the uh, technology stack, but um, Rafi has already mentioned it. And I'd just like to point out that the USDS playbook um, calls out a number of plays which we have already mentioned here. Uh, the use of a modern technology stack, um, modern design effort, which obviously uh, has gone into this um, project and iterative approaches are all part of the USDS playbook for how things should be run. And before I go on to my next question, I just like to assert my opinion that it's important for the public to be somewhat understanding of performing experiments to try to avoid big expenses, right? Um, that is, someone could listen to this video and say, uh, what, you started with a node server and then you threw it away? Well, all those weeks you spent working on the node server were obviously wasted. And so this is an example of waste, fraud, and abuse, right? But in fact, the opposite is true, that by moving very quickly, you are actually being very conservative uh, by always testing each thing one step at a time in an iterative function so that you never uh, waste a lot of money. Um, and, you know, my hope is that we will move to an environment where we can freely talk about those things without having a chilling effect of someone being afraid to say, well, yes, we tried something and it was a, it was a failure, uh, as, as if that's a, a very negative thing. Uh, so thank you, gentlemen. Um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, open source because um, as you probably know, because the Presidential Innovation uh, Fellows Alumni Association weighed in on, on this subject, the federal government has recently published a source code policy for the first time, which encourages the use of open source, but does not demand it. Uh, in all circumstances, although it uh, strongly encourages using 20% open source. Uh, most of my colleagues wanted that to be 100% open source. But if I'm not mistaken, Communicart started out open source and is open source today, and anyone can go and look at the code on GitHub and fork it and use it for any purpose that they wish. Is, is that correct? Yes, it is. Um, and uh, in addition to that, um, I think one of the benefits, you know, obviously, you know, it's the the code is uh, usable by anyone in the public. Um, uh, but we also had uh, the honor of accepting pull requests from complete strangers who stumbled upon the code. Maybe they read a blog post, or um, you know, uh, was were participating in a hackathon uh, where C two was featured. Um, and they just uh, submit a pull request and we were able to benefit from uh, their knowledge and their contributions. Uh, so that's definitely one of the, the things that we've been able to benefit from. So, so this is something that's very near and dear to my heart, although I've had strong debates with people in government about how m well this can function. But I'd like to point out that this is huge, right? Basically, people for free, for no e money and no reward, made contributions to your source code, which you no doubt carefully vetted before using or discarding. And then in, in that way, they directly saved the taxpayer money. Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I would love to see that happen more and more in the future. Of course, I don't want to mislead people. I strongly suspect the code that was contributed here probably was like 1% of the total code that you wrote. Or perhaps you could comment on that. I mean, how, how much code was actually contributed with free of charge by the public? Sure. Offhand, I, I don't know. I mean, there's if you look at all the contributors, there's probably over a dozen um, contributors. And, you know, three or four have just kind of stumbled on it and, you know, updated documentation and, um, you know, found uh, some uh, areas of refactoring and things like that. So not a huge mm -hmm. amount. Um, but a, a huge opportunity for government to interact 
with developers and and uh, people who are excited about what's happening in government. So I think it's a it is a huge opportunity uh, to engage for sure. Right. Thank you. Um, so, um, go ahead, John. If I could just offer. So first of all, um, I'll, I'll start by saying, you know, put the put the punch up front. I'm a hundred percent in favor of um, making as much of the government's code open source as possible. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be right now sitting in a working group um, that's trying to do that at GSA and have been able to make um, get our project, the Acquisition Gateway, on the top of the list for uh, for being open source. Um, I do want to, you know, and I have a perhaps slightly minority perspective on this, but I I, I want to suggest that the the strongest reasons for doing that are um, are more about um, transparency and um, and and less about actually believing that that's a way to um, to reduce cost. Um, in general, you know, the best way to reduce cost is going to be to use um, already established open source components. Um, you know. If you're building something for which there wasn't an open source offering, um, you know it's a little bit less likely that that's going to be something exciting to um, you know to a private sector uh, developer. Although other government organizations or NGOs certainly would would benefit from it. And and the, then the last point um, is philosophically um, the same uh, value proposition that we put around the product we're building, which is we want to draw users um, as opposed to have policy that forces people to behave a certain way. Um, I think that um, you know enforcing a rule that says all government source code um, should be open, um, you know, in a way um, could produce as much um, you know undesired consequence in terms of groups just defensively finding ways to to not do that. I think that the real win comes when we can start to demonstrate the benefits of products that have voluntarily and proactively put the source code out there. And in fact, um, you know, the Communicart C2 example, you know, is is perhaps a little bit in that that vein, given the examples you just shared. Um, and I, I also think that there are some, and, and this is probably a topic for another um, day, but uh, there are some things about the way that we're building out our technology that are designed to make the open source sort of a, a co-driver of being able to rapidly scale what we're doing. So that's where I think the big wins come. Well, thank you. To real quick to piggyback on some of those ideas, um, one thing I love about open source and, and how it's affected C2 is now that we're offloading or handing off the project, it really gave our government um, partners a lot of options. You know, it's it's not like there are, you know, a, a, a dozen Ruby developers out there. There are, are, are multitudes now, and uh, it's a pretty widely accepted framework, uh, Ruby on Rails. Um, and so uh, the acquisition gateway could um, choose uh, any number of vendors. Uh, to do the work, um, as well as even you know consider having people internally, um, you know government workers even um, to come in as as a developer, and and to work on a project like this. So um, open source opens up all kinds of opportunities, and it doesn't um, have them tied to a particular uh, developer. Yeah, that's a that's a really great point, and um, and to the credit of Rafi and his team. Um, you know, we are in that transition right now, and and I was told today by um, the product owner and my in my group that's doing uh, that's leading the the management of it that um, the developer that's picking up this project uh, has never had as smooth a handoff um, as they're having with this one, and um, and there's a there's a bigger story I think around the um, the transition or even the uh, in in some of the larger uh, government acquisitions, the the whole question of competing um, a a software award, which is that there are a small number of really large companies whose names we probably all know, who have 
multi-year, many millions of dollar awards to do software development, um, one of the obstacles to a competitor being successful at a recompete is that they don't have any visibility into the work that was done, so they can't make a competent um, bid. By making that code open, um, it, it gives people a chance to compete more effectively, and it also means they're going to be more ready to come on board if, in fact, they become the uh, you know the winner in the next round. Right. Um, and by the way, that's what yeah that points out one of my favorite um, aspects, which um, you know to use the 18th century terminology is sort of the public shaming, which is that if you're one of these big companies and your competitors. Um, are sniping away at you, pointing out like bad moves that you've made in your code, it's going to force you to do a better job. Those are all good things. Right, right. So this is um, this is really a gigantic topic. Um, and I completely agree. Transparency is extremely valuable. We don't really need to settle uh, which aspect of this is uh, more important. But let me just point out one more thing before we go on to something else, which is if a firm, a for-profit firm, wish to create a startup uh, around the idea of managing approvals, they could start with the Communicar code today, right? So in a sense, the, the code which the taxpayer has paid for is being given back to the American citizen. Anyone can use it for any purpose they want. The, the fact is it's highly specific to government approval processes right now, but uh, if someone chose to put the elbow grease into uh, modifying it, they could. And that's the nice thing about open source. Um, so, uh, John, um, I'd like to go back to you. Um, both you and Rafi have been um, uh, champions of agile practices in government. Um, Rafi, uh, whom I've worked with more at the the engineering team lead, and I think perhaps you, John, more at the politics of the departmental level. Um, can you talk about the status of Agile within the GSA as you see it right now? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to focus on the acquisition service, which is where um, I've had the, the most experience. And, and I will say that while um, it's probably true that uh, some of my work has been having an impact at, I think you called it the political or the organizational level, the, the single greatest um, tool I've had for doing that has been to apply it at the project level. So, um, yeah, I believe that you can't separate um, the sort of the policy and and direction setting from the execution. Um, you know, it goes along with you know a lot of you know agile software principles. What I'm trying to do, and, and, I, and I'm pretty excited that we have a group of people that's moving that direction, is really um, do what now I guess is mostly called like a third wave of Agile inside of um, you know, the FAS organization, which means not just having individual projects that are agilely um, executed, but actually making, you know, the, running the entire um, service as an agile focused business. And um, there's, um, it, when you when you describe it that way, I think sometimes people are a little bit um, cautious, but when you talk about the actual practices, which are in fact being agile at the business level, there's been a lot of support from the leadership. Um, and that has um, allowed the agile behavior at the IT level to be more successful. Um, there's really... So let, let, let me interrupt let me, because we're running okay, out of time yeah. here. I mean, would you say that Agile is on the upswing within the parts of government that you're aware of? Yeah, so I was going to say um, um, that the default for any new program um, or even um, you know, a project that's, that's working with like an update to a legacy system, the default is to... Um, follow some level of agile practice and um you know i think in many cases uh being more agile uh would be better but 
we have to acknowledge that you know we're um, we're turning an oil tanker here, and it takes a little bit of time. Um, every time that we um, we we bring a program into an agile mindset, and they have good results, that just makes it easier to um, to get to the next one. And and now we even have leadership who they um, you know they reasonably competently talk about terminology like. You know what's in the release plan? What's the next sprint? Um, and 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 then what's an MVP? So so they're able to think in those terms, um, which helps a lot when trying to move a project forward. Okay, thank you very much. And so my my final question is for Rafi. Um, you know, eighteen F has been written up in some important magazines. It's, it gets some press. You know, it, it sort of has a bit of glamour associated with it. Um, can you explain to people who may not know um, the role of Agile within 18F itself? Sure, I, I, I can only offer maybe my perspective. I think for, um, for me, I, I feel like uh, one thing I appreciate about 18F in, in terms of Agile is um, how we, we still maintain a lot of autonomy in the, uh, on the project level. So. Um, a lot of teams are self-organizing and they figure out um, what tools they need and what processes they need. And, you know, Agile is one of the things on their tool belt to get the to get the work done. So um, it's not to say that um, uh, Waterfall is, um, you know, we would never do Waterfall, but, you know, Agile is kind of like our thing. Um, we'll, we'll pick projects that are um, very Agile um, friendly um, allows us to iterate and get immediate feedback and improve that sort of thing. Um, so I do appreciate the fact that we are still very team focused, um, and those teams have that autonomy to figure out their processes. Um, we do have an agile guild, so we have these uh, this concept of guilds, so groups that organize and they have their own chat rooms and you know get together weekly to support each other and help each other kind of grow in the disciplines. Um, so whether you're doing Scrum or Kanban, um, kind of just being well versed in kind of the tools that you have at your disposal. So um, those are um, just kind of uh, regular things that we we do, and it's it's constantly a conversation. Um, I think the last thing I would mention about Agile in uh, 18F, which I'm really excited about, is um, one of our business units, 18F Learn. Um, they part of um, their mission is to um, go into these agencies and equip them. Uh, with the ability to do Agile and to just kind of use the same kind of practices that we're using in our projects and to uh, propagate them throughout government um, within the agencies. And so, um, you know, recently I found out about uh, Department of Labor. Um, they're in the middle of use, uh, doing kind of their first cohort of uh, 18F Learn folks who are kind of boot camping uh, through the um, Agile process and learning what that means. Um, even if they're not a project manager, uh, they might be a, uh, you know, someone out in the field or someone doing projects that aren't related to software, uh, but they're learning the principles for Agile. So um, as far as some of the things that we're doing outside of 18F and reaching out to government, um, that's probably one of the efforts that I'm really, really excited about. Well, thank you. That's, that is exciting. Um, perhaps, uh uh, the people from 18F Learn would um, be willing to come on the show and tell us a little bit about that uh, later. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so let me give it back to Elizabeth now. Um, thank you, gentlemen, both for being on the show. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rafi, and thank you, Rob, for those great questions. Um, for our listeners, if you want to find us online, we have a LinkedIn group, Agile Government Leadership. Um, we have a website, agilegovleaders.org, and you can also watch other videos on YouTube. Um, we're very excited to welcome people who are interested in Agile or who are using Agile and government to join us. And again, thanks so much, everyone, for listening. We'll see you later. Bye.